This is Incredible Stories Podcast, Episode 27, The Goat Gland Doctor, Part 2. Hello, everyone. It's time for another Incredible Stories podcast. I'm Josh Virla, your Bedlamite host, and thanks for being here. Last week, we covered part one of The Goat Gland Doctor, where we went over the early life of Dr. John R. Brinkley. And if you haven't listened to part one, I recommend you going back and doing so, because today, we're going to get into the meat of it. I will be detailing the goat gland transplant craze, skepticism, and downfall of Dr. Brinkley. You see, not only did Brinkley make a lot of money from a questionable practice, he was also determined to keep it, and to do so, he turned to radio, a run for governor, and Mexico. Here's what I know. By 1918, Dr. Brinkley was performing more and more operations where he would implant goat testicles into his male patients. Now, to be clear, he kept the original parts of the human, but he would add them a little something extra. Uh, I guess like a booster pack. Apparently, goat testes are roughly the same size as a human when the goats are young. And the doctor preferred using three-week-old goats, because if you've ever seen a full-grown goat, I mean, those guys, well, let's just say some of them look like they could benefit from a wheelbarrow. But at any rate, most of the time when the doctor did his surgery, the goat glands would be absorbed by the body anyways, because it was a foreign material, right? If you remember last episode, I said he was performing these operations at $750 per pop, or about $12,000 in today's money. So the incentive was obviously there for Dr. Brinkley. In fact, he expanded to start including women. Yes, women too wanted the power of the goat to help them with their reproductive issues, such as not being able to bear children. And, no, he didn't transplant goat testicles into women. That would be crazy! He used female goat ovaries instead. Oddly, Dr. Brinkley said that women got benefits from the goat transplant sooner than men who had the operation. And he also said that fatties got less fat after the transplant. Now, I'm not a doctor, but perhaps this might have been more from the infections and illnesses that followed the operations. And to be sure, throughout his career of doing these operations, people died. I'm not sure on the exact numbers, but he was sued more than 12 times for wrongful death between 1930 and 1941. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So you say, Josh, how could people get fooled by this? Well, the wife of his first patient ended up having a baby. What? Yeah. I guess he lucked out by the patient's body not rejecting the goat glands or his first patient getting sick and the patient's original bits still worked. But a major newspaper in his area picked up this story and business as they say really started to zoom. And now that gave him license to expand his claims that his goat glands helped with 27 different ailments ranging from dementia to gassiness. He even started a very effective mail campaign boasting his treatments. Well, by now, Dr. Brinkley was not only gaining the attraction of the public, but his questionable operations and claims attracted the attention of the American Medical Association. And they are, of course, the largest association of physicians. But the AMA was like, this Dr. Brinkley guy, things that make you go, hmm... So the AMA sent an undercover agent to check out the doctor's clinic, and the agent noticed some shenanigans. Like, for instance, a woman who the doctor gave goat ovaries to treat a spinal cord tumor, she was walking around the clinic in considerable pain. Sure, why not? That's a good way to treat spinal cord tumors, right? Well, the AMA continued to hound Brinkley throughout the rest of his career. They would write papers and call him a quack, you know, just for years and years. 
But the AMA didn't have any legal authority to do anything, really, and most of their articles were written within the doctoral community, so the public wasn't getting a lot of the information anyways. But his notoriety steadily rose, and there were skeptical members of the general public, and one of those was Los Angeles Times owner Mr. Harry Chandler. And Chandler issued a challenge to Brinkley. He threw down a gauntlet for him. You see, Mr. Chandler challenged Brinkley to do a goat gland transplant on one of his editors. How he convinced an editor to do this is beyond me. I'm sure as hell I wouldn't do that, but you know, money talks. So Chandler told Brinkley if the operation was a success, he would make him the most famous of surgeons in America because he had a big time paper, right? But if Brinkley failed, then he would be disgraced and ruined. Sounds like good terms to me. Brinkley accepted the challenge and the operation was a success. What? Yeah, apparently the editor was cured of his ailments and true to his word, Mr. Chandler gave praise to Brinkley's methods. This made Brinkley even more popular and soon Hollywood stars came a calling because celebrities like fads that borderline on the insane, right? No different than today. So as a result of this, Brinkley's practice expanded and more money came his way. By 1923, he built his own radio station. Yeah, that's how much money he was rolling in. So he started to advertise his expertise over the airways. Now, remember, he was gaining his fair share of critics, and in 1924, California slapped him with an indictment for his fake medical credentials. Remember when he did the operation for the LA Times editor? Well, he didn't have a recognized medical license to perform in California. Although he did get a 30-day waiver to do the operation, he brought questions about the diploma mill industry with him. So California sent some lawmen to Kansas, which is where Brinkley lived at the time, and they wanted to arrest him. Ah, but the governor of Kansas said no to extraditing Brinkley. And why would he? Brinkley was a famous slash prominent person of Kansas who was rich and employed many people now, and he was good for business for Kansas. Well, Brinkley continued with his radio advertising, and he also pioneered some radio entertainment formats with his station. He would feature bands, country music acts, French lessons, Hawaiian songs, which were very exotic at the time. He'd have storytellers and fortune tellers come on air. He was a real pioneer of the variety act thing. So much money was rolling in now that Brinkley built the city of Milford, Kansas, where his practice was, new sewage systems, sidewalks, he built apartments and installed new fangle-dangled electricity, and even a new post office to handle all his mail. Gee, all these public work things, Brinkley seems like a pretty nice guy. Well, he liked money. Oh, I might mention in 1927 he had himself another baby. This time a boy, and that was 14 years after his last kid. And although he denied having implanted goat glands into himself, I'm sure the talk and rumors of this only bolstered his rep. Now, Brinkley also set up a nice little racket where he created a network of pharmacies that sold his own medicines at a higher than normal price, and Brinkley would get a kickback from this. He was making by some accounts as much as $14,000 a week just from the pharmacy alone or about $197,073 in today's money. You heard that right. Extrapolate that. That's over $10 million a year. Ah, uh, it's good to be goat king. So by now, more and more sick people and claims that Brinkley wasn't treating his patients correctly started to mount. The Kansas City Star started running unfavorable reports on him and these had a lot of weight behind them because the Kansas City Star was a pretty reputable paper. By 1930, the Kansas City Medical Board finally held hearings to determine if Brinkley should keep his medical license. And some of the evidence in support of revoking his license included 42 death certificates which Brinkley had to sign after apparently well patients had went belly up after receiving his treatments. 
And those were just the ones that could be immediately proved. So the medical board said, okay, no license for you. And they stated that Brinkley had, quote, performed an organized charlatanism quite beyond the invention of the humble Montebank, unquote. Well, that sucks for Brinkley. Oh, and then the Federal Radio Commission refused to renew his license six months later on the account of his programming being largely just advertising and that he broadcast obscene materials. Oh, and also the fact that he prescribed diagnoses to patients over the radio on his call-in medical question box show. Ouch. Well, he sued, of course, and the case eventually made its way via appeal to the D.C. Circuit Court. But they upheld the revocation of the radio license. Now, this was a major landmark case in the world of broadcast law. So, all you broadcast law files, ha <laughs> Brinkley was not one to give up though, and who could blame him? When you're pulling in 10 mil a year, I'd want to keep that up too. So what did Brinkley do? What anyone desperate for power with questionable ethics does. He ran for public office. Specifically, he wanted to be governor of Kansas. If he achieved this, he would have the power to reinstate his medical license because he would get to appoint members to the medical board that agreed with him. Sneaky sneaky. To note, his campaign began three days after he lost his medical license, so he still had his radio station at this point, and he did pretty good. He was a master at self-promotion and publicity stunts, which worked well. He gathered a lot of people under his tent promising public works, lower taxes, and appealed to the immigrants. Brinkley received 29.5% of the votes as a write-in candidate, but ultimately lost to Franklin Roosevelt's eventual Secretary of War, Harry Hine Woodring. Now, here is an interesting twist. You see, Brinkley probably actually won the election, but as it turns out, the Kansas Attorney General changed the rules for write-in candidates just three days before the election. And bonus fact, the Attorney General was the same guy who prosecuted Brinkley before the medical board. So yeah, he was not a fan. So what the Attorney General did was he said as a write-in candidate, Dr. Brinkley's name could only be written one specific way. So you couldn't have variants of his name, Dr. John Brinkley, Dr. Brinkley, John Brinkley, etc. Now that's some political shenanigans. As a result, between 30 to 50,000 ballots that were in Brinkley's favor were disqualified. And if they were counted, he would have won. Karma, right? In 1932, he ran again though, and this time he received 30% of the votes, but still lost. So he decided to move close to the Mexican border, leaving his Milford Medical Clinic in the ward of two of his protégés who were still able to practice medicine. And where did he move? Well, to Del Rio, Texas, across the bridge from Mexico, like right across. And from here, he would get a radio license from the Mexican government where he could continue his old radio format of giving medical advice and prescribing callers his various cures from the town of Villa Acuna. Today, it's called Ciudad Acuna. His new radio station was XER, and because he was on the border, it was able to reach homes in the U.S. So of course, this angered the U.S. government, and they tried to figure out a way to shut Brinkley down. The State Department put some pressure on the Mexican government, and predictably, they shut his radio station down while Brinkley was still building it. But money talks, and after a few weeks, construction picked back up again, and Brinkley was back in business. I guess the Mexican government were like, eh, we don't care what the State Department says. Brinkley, you seem like a good guy to us. Now, eventually, Brinkley was able to get the Mexican government to allow him to increase his wattage to a staggering 1 million watts, which at the time made his radio station the strongest radio station on the earth. So strong it was that it could be heard as far away as Canada on a good night. And some people accounted that they could hear the signal over wires and even barbed wire fences. Crazy, right? For some perspective, the average wattage of a modern FM radio station is something like 50 to 100,000 watts. 
So Brinkley was crossing the Mexican border to make his broadcast until the US government was like, hold it right there bub, you aren't allowed to cross the border. So Brinkley was like, fine. And he just called into the radio station from the Texas side of the border to make his broadcasts. And then the government was like, wait just a hot second. And passed a law, called the Brinkley Act by the way, forbidding the rebroadcasting of telephone calls. So Brinkley was like, I can do this all day boys. And he pre-recorded his shows, which was kind of pioneering at the time. And then he had a driver take his recordings across the border to the radio station. So he really stuck it to the government there. And of course, his powerful radio station attracted advertisers and he was happy to sell them advertising slots at a rate of $1,700 an hour or about $27,266 an hour in today's money. That seems like a lot, but compared to national TV commercial spots for 30 seconds, it's a bargain. Also remember, radio back then was the prevalent form of news, entertainment, and overall lifeblood of American information getting. Following the success Brinkley had with his Border Blaster radio, a lot of other stations followed suit to broadcast questionable or banned material from south of the border. Now in 1934, the US government was able to put enough pressure back on the Mexican government to force them to take away Brinkley's broadcast license. Now, the Mexican government and the U.S. government had their own beef over radio issues. I'm not going to get into it in this show, but there were reasons for this State Department pressure on Mexico and then Mexico backing off of it. Anyways, Brinkley was like, fine, I'll stop radioing. But he continued to do surgeries as I'm guessing Texas was one of the eight states that originally recognized Brinkley's medical license. However, he still owned the radio station, so he was getting paid from ad revenues there. He just personally wasn't allowed to broadcast. But my boy Brinkley was still pulling in the dollars. Although he did the occasional goat gland transplant, he did a lot more vasectomies and prostate rejuvenations, whatever that is. He also continued to prescribe his own pricey medicines, and his business continued to thrive. So much so, he opened a colon clinic in San Juan, Texas. I guess he liked getting in there deep. Speaking of deep, his pockets were so deep by now that he bought himself a fancy mansion on 16 acres, had himself a dozen fancy Cadillacs, fountain gardens, exotic animals, and a cement pond for swimming. The mansion, by the way, still stands and is a Texas landmark, so that's a plus. Now, in 1938, a guy named Morris Fishman, who had been behind the scenes working with the AMA to discredit Brinkley's quackery for years, re-emerged and published a paper calling Brinkley a charlatan and called out his shady practices. Well, Brinkley didn't like this and sued him for several million dollars. And in 1939, a jury found in favor of Fishman reaffirming his assertions by stating Brinkley, quote, should be considered a charlatan and a quack in the ordinary well understood meaning of those words." Unquote. Ah, that stings. Once this happened, the lawsuits began flooding in against Brinkley. By some estimates, the lawsuits were over $3 million in total. Also at this time, the IRS pounced on Brinkley for tax fraud and evasion. Brinkley declared bankruptcy in 1941, although I find it hard to believe he was, as this dude was pulling in over $10 million a year in his heyday. Bad news isn't over for him just yet though. After he filed for bankruptcy, the post office started investigating him for mail fraud. That's right, the post office. Who gets on the post office bad side? All this took its toll on Brinkley, and he had three heart attacks. Then he had to have one of his legs amputated because of poor circulation resulting. Don't worry doc, a good goat leg transplant should fix you right up. In 1942, he had another heart attack and he died as a result broke and penniless in San Antonio, Texas. Although he was buried in Memphis, Tennessee. He had a fancy grave marker with an angel perched up top. But in 2017, someone or some people defaced his grave and stole the angel from his monument, so that's pretty bad. And that's the story of the Goat Gland Doctor. 
And now you know what I know. Dr. Brinkley wasn't the first charlatan and certainly wasn't the last. People have been scamming other people for as long as man could effectively listen. But, you know, it's easy to fool people when people want to be fooled. Don't get me wrong. What he did was horrible and he took advantage of people who desperately wanted help. They found what they thought was a credible savior in the form of a doctor. But you know what they say, fool me once, shame on you. Cut me open and insert goat gonads into me, shame on me. But here is something you shouldn't find shameful. The haiku. Dr. John Brinkley thought he was the best surgeon. He was not the goat. And that's all the time this week, guys. Check out our main site for other stories on IncredibleStoriesPodcast.com. Send me an email or haiku or show suggestion at contact at IncredibleStoriesPodcast.com or simply go to the website and fill out the form. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at IncredPod. Rate us on iTunes and peep us out on YouTube and Stitcher. For Incredible Stories Podcast, I'm Josh, and remember, the journey of a thousand tales begins with the first word.